Hello, my name is Susan Chan, and I'm here to talk to you from the University of Guelph um, on the provisioning behavior by hoary squash bees on cultivated cucurbita. <coughs> the hoary squash bee is the most widespread wild bee in North America. You can see its range in the green here on the map. Um, it is a bee that co-evolved with the uh, with plants with wild plants in the genus cucurbita and it is a strict pollen specialist on those plants its wild host uh, its wild host range is in yellow on the map and you can see that outside of that range the bee is actually entirely dependent upon um, plants that are cultivated in this genus so these would include pumpkin and squash in ontario our first record of the hoary squash bee is from 1908 and in, two, in uh, uh, 1999, uh, a, a survey was done and about two thirds of, of uh, pumpkin and squash farms had this bee foraging on their plants. Uh, here depicted, you can see a cultivated cucurbita flower. This is a male staminate flower, which is the flower that bears the pollen. And below it, you can see a male hoary squash bee clinging to the synandria in the middle of the flower. And the synandria is the part, is a few, are fused anthers that bear pollen. <coughs> Cucurbita, uh, which include a pumpkin and squash, are really important for habitat, provide a lot of habitat for uh, hoary squash bees. They provide copious amounts of nectar. You can see those on the left-hand side, little droplets there in the nectaries. They provide copious amounts of pollen, here depicted on the synandria. The bees mate on these flowers, and in the evenings, in the afternoons, when the flowers wilt, the bees use the wilted flowers as resting spots. Uh, in Ontario, the bees are entirely dependent upon uh, cultivated cucurbita to survive. <laughs> so the, the um, focus of my talk is actually the provisioning activities of female hoary squash bees uh, on uh, cucurbita crops. And I think to provide a better context, you have to sort of understand the whole cycle of nesting. And so you can see that bees, the bee has to build a a vertical tunnel, then she has to build lateral tunnels, and the lateral tunnels have nest cells on them. The nest cells have to get prepared, waterproofed, and then she can start foraging and bringing pollen into those nest cells. So we're today concentrating on the activities that are occurring in the in this in this D circle and the associated foraging. After she uh, provisions a cell, then a bee lays an egg, and then she seals the cell off. <coughs> So the provisioning cycle actually involves two parts. It involves the foraging component, which is the part in which the bee is flying out to the patch and, and returning. So um, it, the, the length, the duration of the, of the first part flying from the nest to the flower patch depends on how far away she is from the patch, but these bees often nest very, very close to patches. Then there's the issue of flower handling time. Uh, these bees are specialized uh, uh, they have a specialized behavior on these flowers, and so their handling time is very low, and they're very good at handling these flowers. However, there's an interesting thing that happens because these bees mate on the flowers. Uh, females who are foraging for pollen or nectar are often harassed by males who are looking for mates. <coughs> the bees then have to fly between the flowers and the patch, and the flowers are quite spatially, um, they're not close together in the patch but each flower provides so much resources. So we have a concentration of resources and there are also many, many, many plants in a patch because these things are usually produced by the acre. Uh, the bees afterwards then have to fly back to the nest and this again involves distance and they may be slowed down if they have a really heavy resource load. The, next co the nest component involves them walking into the nest. They have to groom off their pollen, regurgitate nectar into the prepared nest cell and then they return to foraging. Or if their nest cells are full, they have to lay an egg on the provisions and seal the nest cell and begin excavating the next lateral and the next nest cell. The questions I'm going to uh, give you the results of, the questions I'm going to answer today are how much pollen does a single staminate flower provide? How many pollen grains does a hoary squash bee carry per foraging trip? What is the duration of the foraging and nesting components of the, of the provisioning cycle? How much pollen is in a fully provisioned nest cell? How many offspring can a female provide for in a daily foraging period on cucurbita crops?
So I'm going to describe my methods here to um, to uh, to quantify the pollen loads on the staminate flowers. I just um, wrap the flowers in blue painter's tape, as you see here, the day before at the bud stage. I then the next day I came and collected them. They had a full pollen load, which had been dehissed. I was able to collect that into a microcentrifuge tube and then process it and count the pollen grains under the under a 25x microscope. <laughs> The pollen loads on females were uh, interesting. I was able to capture the bees as they walked into their nests. I just picked them up. They're very, they're very gentle and easy to handle. And I put them into a microcentrifuge tube and I put them in the fridge overnight. And while they were in the fridge overnight, they actually groomed all the pollen off of themselves into the bottom of the tube. And then I could release them the next day uh, into a, a pumpkin patch. Here you have depicted what the bee would look like, but that is a male hoary squash bee, not a female hoary squash bee. <laughs> to count, to um, measure the duration of the provisioning cycle, a whole crew of us, uh, this is only some of them, were involved in this, and we watched 49 uh, nest cells over uh, two years, eight days in one year and 10 days in the other year, and we watched them from six in the morning till noon, measuring the amount of, the duration of the, of the, of the period when they were in their nest and when they were outside of their nest at um, distinct times of day, like six, seven, eight, nine to 12. We also collected pollen from nest cells and we did this by digging up nests and finding nest cells in which there was a full pollen, uh, a full provisioning load in the nest cell. We knew this because there was an egg and the egg had not hatched and had not started eating the pollen. <coughs> So what were our results? Well, we found that there were about 49,000 pollen grains in a synandrium, on a synandrium, and about 40, about 6% uh, of those pollen grains were lost to the activities of bees. So the, pollens, the pollen would, would fall off the synandrium and into the base of the flower where it would not be used. So that means that about 46,000 pollen grains were available to bees to use, and they used them um, to, to provision their nest cells, but they also deposited them on the, uh, the, the gynecium of the flower uh, to produce pollination. And that was about one, and, and I, count, I did a rough calculation of how many pollen grains would be dedicated to that, and it only, they, they only needed about 1.2% of the synandrium pollen load to pollinate all the female flowers in a patch. And then there are other sources of waste. <laughs> so interestingly enough, because the proportion of pollen resources needed for pollination is small, 1.2%, female hoary squash bees can be considered as functioning as ecosystem upcyclers. They're taking a waste product, which is pollen, and they're turning it into um, offspring. The pollen load on a female is about 3,000 pollen grains, and that weighs about 5 milligrams. Uh, a, a female's bee, a female hoary squash bee's mass is 110 milligrams, and so it means that her pollen load is about 4.5 percent of her mass, and that's like a 150 pound person carrying um, one uh, one four liter bag of milk. <coughs> then we looked at the number of pollen grains in nest provisions, and we found that it was about 63,000 pollen grains, and that it took about 20 foraging trips to gather that many pollen grains or the resources of 1.2 stem flowers. Uh, interestingly enough, it also gave us information about how much pollen a hoary squash bee larva consumes in its lifetime. And so this information is really important because I was able to use it to look at exposure to pesticides in pollen uh, because I knew how much uh, larva actually ate. <coughs> The duration of a provisioning cycle included two things, the foraging component, as I've already talked to you about, and the within nest activities. Um, what I found is that if I aggregated all the data, the foraging component and the within nest activities were not significantly different from each other, and they were about four plus minutes each. Okay. Um, there was also no significant difference in the duration of the provisioning cycle over time. So when we measured them at six, seven, eight, all the way to noon, and we took the whole provisioning cycle, there was no significant difference over time. However, there was a significant effect of individual bees on the duration of pro uh, provisioning cycles. So some bees were much more efficient uh, provisioners than others. 
we also found that there was a significant difference in the length of of, the for, of a foraging trip over time. So what we found is there was a significant difference between the length of the foraging trip at 7 a.m., which was about 4.32 minutes, and the length of the, of the provisioning trip at 9 a.m., which is about 6.9 minutes. So it's almost one and a half times longer at 9 a.m. And what I've done here is I've put up a, a graph of pollen depletion in this, uh, in this crop uh, over time. So what we have is we have the times on the bottom and on the uh, y-axis we have the number of pollen grains per synandrium. And you can see there is a very steep decline between 7 and 9 a.m. in the amount of pollen that's actually available on the synandria. And so this is a very good explanation for why um, foraging trips would be longer. <coughs> So how many offspring can be provisioned in a day? Well, we know from before that it takes about 20, 20 foraging trips to gather enough pollen to provision an nest cell, and that each provisioning cycle is about 9.72 minutes long. So if we multiply those two, we know that to provision an nest cell, it takes about 3.24 hours or three hours and 15 minutes. This fits neatly into the period between 6 and 9.15 a.m when um, pollen supplies are at their greatest. And after that, pollen supplies are really depleted almost to nothing. So we know that a bee can actually provision one offspring per day. Uh, interestingly enough, um, bees can mature one oocyte per day uh, under normal conditions on average. <laughs> so to wrap up, hoary squash bees can maximize their intrinsic reproductive capacity in association with eucurbita crops. Um, and this may be one of the reasons why they have been able to expand their range so well, because uh, cucurbita crops are grown over a wide area and they support these bees really well. <clears throat> uh, provisioning information provides a basis to evaluate exposure to pesticides in pollen for ground nesting bees. And I've already done this and you can look up this paper, which is in scientific reports uh, following this DOI. Uh, there is a knowledge gap which needs to be filled, and as of at the present, we don't know the difference in provisioning amounts for male and female offspring. We do know, however, that females are much are much larger than males, and so we would expect their uh, female provisioning cells to have much more pollen in them than male provisioning cells. At this moment, I'd like to thank the uh, Fresh Vegetable Growers of Ontario and the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and Food for their support for this project, and I'd be happy to take any questions you have. <laughs>